Obligatory spoiler warning for 20th Century Boys. Today we're looking at the live action movies one by one for 20th Century Boys to see how they do. This is coming fresh off the big video on the manga, so my head is kind of full of manga knowledge at the moment. I think the case for all of these movies is that it's going to be very hard to divorce my knowledge of the manga to enjoying the movies on their own, so I can't really look at these movies in isolation. The plan is to go through each of the films and see how they do. I have watched these before to make that video, but besides the big stuff, there's a lot I've already forgotten. I'm fairly sure my opinion will stay the same from the first time I watched them though, and that's that the movies are just a really inferior way of telling the story, and I'd only ever recommend them to fans of the manga. But let's see if that changes, and what better place to start than with the beginning of the end. So the first movie. This was, this was surprisingly fun, I had a good time. This movie covers the first arc leading up to the Bloody New Year's Eve as well as the flashbacks of the Bloody New Year's Eve as well. So we go all the way through to the robot blowing up. What we very quickly learn about the movies is that they're going to be a bit hokey, not the best shot or brightness balanced, and it's going to be very streamlined. Kirion's wedding is cut out, as is a lot of Ocho's time in Bangkok, even Ocho's history with his son hasn't even shown up yet. And that's really because it's a different medium now and it needs to adapt to that. Making a good movie is much different to a manga. One of the best things about the movies is that they're made from a space of already knowing the whole story. So moments are added early on to set up the final reveals. Things like Yuki saying that she went to Kenji's concert 10 years ago, name dropping Yamane at the class reunion, or in, in the Donkey Science Room flashback, you actually hear a rope tightening before he jumps out. The best parts are how they set up Katsumata really early on. Comments alluding to the justice idea that we know is going to be really important later on, and they also set up the justice badge flashback now, rather than, you know, during the final showdown. And I really like that choice, I think it's going to make the villain's story just tie together a lot stronger. I was never a fan of how Katsumata is handled in the manga, so it looks like the movies are making space to set this up better, and that's great. There is clearly a lot of care being paid towards the source material. The bits that aren't changed have a lot of just shot for shot remakes of the original manga panels. But like I said earlier, the movies are a lot more streamlined, and with that comes a lot of cuts and just rushing through certain scenes. Personally, one of my bigger gripes with this movie is that it's a lot more plot centric, focusing on building up to the event of the bloody New Year's Eve and leaving out some of the character moments that really invested us into feeling the gang struggle. The characters are my favourite part of the series, so yeah, it did kind of suck to see them shortchanged here. So when we get to scenes like everyone coming together to fight friend, it doesn't really hit like it's supposed to. But even those strong plot moments are still hurt from the pacing too. The bloody New Year's Eve until Kenji gets on the robot is real quick. Yuki and Mon don't even get a minute between them. Fukubei dies with only Ocho watching, and the whole broadcast plot and Fukubei's history is just removed. One of the more interesting changes is actually in the opening. They've taken out the UN and the robot shots and replaced it with Ocho in prison. So instead of this idea that a group of people are going to save the world from this robot thing, we know the world turns to pot and our heroes are going to fail. I mean, that's fair enough considering these movies were set up as a trilogy and they named it Beginning of the End. It does really hurt the first half hour though. We don't get a good idea of what the actual plot is going to be, rather it's just jumping around setting up different things in Kenji's life. I can't forget to mention one of my favourite things about these movies though. Man, this sounds good. Just getting these moments from the manga elevated with the soundscape. 20th Century Boy, the song, I'm so glad they got the rights to use this. I mean, I can't play it here for copyright, but just there's something about watching this story come to life with that song going that just does something to me. I don't know, I think I'm just a very audio based person when it comes to movies. Just hearing some of these scenes breathes so much life into them. One of my favorites is when Kenji's boys grab baby Kana. <laughs> the concert, or just hearing how Friend sounds chanting Let's Play to Kenji. So far it's been a relatively faithful adaptation. I can't wait to see when they start doing the weird stuff. The Last Hope. Well, 
Well, uh, this one, this one is the worst one. As you'd expect, this handles the second arc from Kana's introduction through to Friend's resurrection. And this is where the wheels start falling off as the movies try to carve out their own direction. I could really be here all day spelling out all the differences, but here are the main ones. The two trips into the virtual attraction are now rolled into one. Sada is just in and out of this movie, only in for like 10 minutes and then he's gone for the rest of the trilogy. And Friend doesn't get shot in the science room. I guess they weren't into carrying that symbolism forward. Here, Friend is doing this parade pilgrimage thing to the Shinjuku church when Acho shows up to threaten him, but Yamane gets Friend first. To its credit, the movie does start much stronger than part one did though. Part one really takes a while to establish what the actual threat they're building up to is. This time, the first two scenes are literally, there's another book of prophecy and Masuo is heading out to kill Kana and let's go. The biggest criticism of this movie is honestly exactly what I expected going in. It's adapting the longest and arguably the most confusing part of the manga. And so it feels like they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. Either cut out some iconic scenes or keep them in and have the pacing suffer. And they chose the latter. So we kind of just jump from scene to scene without much support between them. Parts like Kana's search for Kiriko seemingly come out of nowhere. It's especially problematic in the first half where it's trying to establish what the world is like, Kana, the assassination plot, the mafia's friends control, Kazumi and the school plot, all at the same time. So despite hitting the ground running, it doesn't really settle down for the first 20-30 minutes. It's all this seemingly barely connected plot until we finally slow down to listen to some Bob Lennon. This movie feels like such a hodgepodge of random plot beats quite often. To be fair, the start of this arc in the manga does this too, but it gets back on track, whereas the movies do not. This movie does introduce two of the best performances in these movies, Kazumi and Takasu. Man, these guys are having an absolute blast. Takasu's direction must have been, you're just, you're crazy and just, just roll with that. Magari! absolute standouts for me. Kana's actress is also doing a fine job too and I keep flipping between really liking her performance and really not. I think that's the movie's fault though and not the actress. She seems great. Now I've seen these movies before so I know where they're going. These are based off the complete edition ending with only Katsumata as friend. Fukube's history has now been completely dropped and co-opted as Katsumata's backstory. He was the one who hung himself in 1971 and the one who loved the expo. This has made some things tie into the story much better, like the whole expo itself and the assassination in the church prophecy. In this movie, Friend intends to go to the church in Shinjuku, where presumably he'll get shot like in the prophecies, making, I think, much better use of that plot point. We also get some more references to the space badge, again keeping it important through the whole trilogy. It's during this scene, just before Friend gets shot, that the movies make the weirdest choice in the whole trilogy. They decided that they still wanted the twist that Friend wasn't the person you thought it was, but without Fukube they have to set up someone else. And they decided that that person should be Yoshitsune. I actually had to go back and watch this again to double check because it was such a strange choice and it's absolutely Yosh's child actor here. I'm sure this whole thing won't just become a big waste of time in the next movie. Returning back to man this sounds good, you know what it's going to be. The Resurrection. Man, this is so good. Hot damn. And of course, we can't forget hearing Bob Lennon for real. This is such a nice clean version of the song and I love it. So, movie two, definitely a step back from the first movie. Hopefully the last one will surprise me and make this whole trilogy work. Redemption. How did this movie manage to wrap up the whole series? Well, after a lot of stumbling, I think it stuck the landing. So what's changed this time? Well, we're rolling with painting Yosh as friend for like 90% of the movie, 21st Century Boys has been half rolled into the final showdown, and Manjom takes over the assassin guy's role in the castle and has also turned against friend. Actually, at the end of it all, he's the one who kills Friend, before what turned out to be a surprisingly funny death. Ah! Ah! 
This movie is much the same beast as the other two. The faster pacing rears its ugly head, making moments like Carry On Coming Back just feel really hollow, and it doesn't really slow down until right at the end. Much like part two, it does start really well. The movies have done a great job tying everything back into Katsumata. This movie opens with the flashback of him being bullied as dead, which we know will come full circle once we get to the end. The main problem with this movie is just the fallout from the last one. A lot of time is spent making Yosh look sus to try and build this twist that it's not really him. And I wonder if this works for people who haven't read the manga, because they still keep him being underground at Tomodachi Land and the whole gang uprising, so I never felt like he could be friend. It's this weird addition again taking time away from the good stuff. And don't get me wrong, good stuff there is. I did say they stuck the landing. The final 10 minutes of this movie are probably the best the whole trilogy gets. Actually, probably more than that, everything from the concert onwards is great. The final bit where Kenji goes back into the VA to apologize to Katsumata, picking up on the complete edition ending. This worked. It took its time and it didn't rush through it, making a really nice landing point for the whole trilogy. Honestly, everything from when Kenji arrives at the concert on is just really strong compared to the other movies. It's definitely a happier tone than the manga, which just scratches some wish fulfillment for me, I think. Kenji ends the movie in such a better place than the manga. Let's talk about Friend, though. Dear Lord, they made him worse. Now, I already have issues with Katsumata's motivations in the manga, and I was really hoping that the movies could make some hot fixes following the new ending. Considering so far they've done a great job setting this up through the whole trilogy, and they could have changed things along the way since they knew the ending they were going to. I was, I was hopeful. Well, what happens with Katsumata? The movies decide to throw together Fukubei's backstory with Katsumata's. And that doesn't work. So all the good Fukube backstory moments like Egghead and the Expo, that's all done by Katsumata here. And I think they must have seen those scenes as key parts of 20th Century Boys, and I'd agree, so they had to put them in. However, they just kind of threw it all together and hoped it would make sense, and it didn't. Take this scene in the elevator. Friend is set up as someone who despises bullies deeply, painting Friend's regime as standing up for the bullied of the world. And then we get the flashback where he bullies Sirakio, and this should have been Fukube. Is Katsumata a bully or vehemently against bullies? By the end of this movie, they honestly try to sell too many explanations of what friend's motivation, and they all contradict each other to the point that he just doesn't make any sense. He wants to save the world from bullies. He thinks the world is unneeded and should be destroyed. He just wants to play with Kenji. He is seeking some sort of redemption from Kenji. It makes this big incoherent mess when he spills his heart right before he dies. And it just doesn't work. But again, Katsumata's never been a character I've really enjoyed the motivations of, so this might just be a me thing. So I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but one of the weird things that these movies struggle with at times is that they feel like bad midday soap opera television. It's really hard to describe, but watch this scene and you'll get what I mean. <laughs> I just can't shake that feeling, like Nathan Fillion is going to come in and make some love triangle. I think it's the slow zoom in, I reckon. Also, just some really funny scenes in this one. Okay, here's our final round of Man This Sounds Good. You know that ending is beautiful. Did a rewatch change my mind on these movies? Not really, no. If you're a fan, they're still worth checking out, but if you want to get someone else into the series, tell them to avoid these movies. The nice moments don't outweigh the weird changes in the cuts. While some parts, yes, I would almost controversially say are better here, too much heart has been lost. 
They just run too fast through moments that needed time to breathe, and despite all of the groundwork setting it up, they still mishandle the Katsumata reveal. I feel kind of bad for criticising these movies because there is such a degree of care and love for the source material behind it. From the look of the cast, the staging of the shots, how much they managed to keep in, even in making sure they got the rights for the song itself. It was fun enough to go through as a fan, but I'm pretty sure this is a series of movies that I will not come back to watch again. Thanks for watching. This has been CG, and I will see you Gs in the next one.